So to my immediate left is uh, Katie Huddleston, and Katie is the Museum and Heritage Coordinator for Museum on the Boyne. Katie is a graduate of Queen's University with a BA in History. She also completed the Ontario Museum Associ Association Certificate in Museum Studies. Katie started her museum career with the Lanark County Museums Association and was part of the team recognized with an OMA Award of Merit for its work to prepare exhibits for the International Plowing Match held in Lanark County in 2003. After learning the ropes of a municipal museum at Heritage House Museum, Katie took the lead role at the Museum on the Boyne and has been there for eight years. Most recently, she has been taking courses to further her knowledge in the identification, conservation, and celebration of built heritage. She is the proud mentor of several emerging museum professionals and is confident that they will one day rule the world. You're here. Uh, just immediately to Katie is Mary Collier. I'm sure most of you know Mary in the room. Uh, Mary is the Professional Development Program Manager for the Ontario Museum Association. So Mary Collier is, as I said, the Professional Development Program Manager with the Ontario Museum Association, a longtime museum lover with degrees in history and adult education, and a graduate certificate in museum management and cura cura curatorialship. Mary has been lucky enough to work in with museums and museum associations in Alberta and Ontario since 2005. When she's not working and spending entirely too much time on the train, she is probably either or wishing she has was at a sing-along. So there's a story behind that one with Mary, sing-along. Sing -along. And then beside Mary, we have Dr. Amy E. Barron. So faculty museum management and curatorship Fleming College, Fleming College, sorry, and interim curator at Scugog Shores Museums. Amy Barron has worked in the museum field for over 20 years, most recently as the curator of the Scugog Shores Museums. She is currently teaching full-time in the Museum Management and Curatorialship Graduate Program, Graduate Certificate Program at Fleming College. <laughs> No doubt some supporters of Amy. She has a PhD in Ancient History and Archaeology from the University of Toronto, as well as a Certificate in Museum Studies from the OMA. For the last three years, Amy has served on the OMA's Museum Succession Pro Project Advisory Board, as well as teaching museums and the community for the OMA's certificate course. And directly beside Amy, we have Marilyn Helvelka. Chief Administrative Officer for Ruthven Park National Historic Site. Marilyn Helvelka is the Chief Administrative Officer at Ruthven Park National Site in Cayuga. A rural not-for-profit, non-government site, it was a change from the many years spent working for the City of Hamilton and ending her career there as the Manager of Cultural Services. Marilyn is a past president of the OMA Association and currently serves as treasurer on the board of Southwest Ontario Tourism Corporation. So welcome to your panel. All right, so um, for the last three years, we've been coming and doing various things related to the museum succession project. So I hope you all kind of know what that was, but just in case, a little review here. Uh, the Museum Succession Project was begun in 2013 as a three-year uh, project funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, who we always appreciate, um, and it was to support and strengthen Ontario's nonprofit museums. Its goals were to create initiatives that would support the OMA's members for several different things, to strengthen governance, to increase community engagement, encourage career and professional development, and secure the support of our museums. So in other words, we wanted to ensure uh, sustainable, vibrant, and engaging sector moving forward to the future. So to do this, there were basically three sort of prongs of what the succession project was doing. So the first prong was to develop leadership and organizational capacity, um, basically to strengthen governance. Uh, to do this, we have been running governance training sessions. Um, anybody here in the room participate in any of the governance training workshops in the last few years? Excellent why you people made it up here. So yeah, excellent. Um, basically, in the last three years, we've run 12 of these government training workshops. And we were trying to do an estimate this morning about how many museums had participated in these workshops, because they've been in various regions. We're using various museum networks. And the best we could come up with was 50 to 100 museums. So that's amazing. I hadn't really heard that stat till this morning. All of them who've come and done this work 
on, uh, on governance. Um, the other thing that's been made available is online on the Ontario Museums Association's website. There are more governance resources available for museums to look at. They're both under a museum succession project, but you can also get them under resources or CMOG. So that was prong one. Uh, the second one was leadership training support, basically the, uh, the goal of trying to make a sustainable uh, museum field. We're, we're not all going to be here forever, which is, I know, of great benefit to my students out there. It's like, yes, get rid of these people. Let's move on. Excellent. So there will be jobs in the future. Uh, but to that, to that end, we form the uh, Merging Museum Professionals sort of subgroup to this. Pretty much that's all we had to do, because once we got them sorted, they just, they just ran with it. And they are amazing. So there are lots of things at the conference that the Emerging Museum Professionals are doing. So feel free to take part in these things. They have um, workshops they're doing during the breaks with different people speaking about uh, sort of how their career paths have gone. So feel free to take part in some of those. I know tonight they're doing a super awesome rockin' trivia contest thing. So get together your teams of four because I will be happy to compete with any of you and we'll see who wins this thing. So it's a challenge. <laughs> All of you, get on there. OK, so we're all going to do that. It's going to be super fun. Uh, they've even got prizes, so that rocks. Uh, the other thing that they did is they have the conference connections. So um, how many people are involved in being either a mentor or a mentee? I see Kathy Blurk by the time. Oh, look at all the hands in the room. That's awesome. There are actually 17 pairs of mentor-mentee conference connections. So the EMP has been doing amazing stuff. Their Facebook page is a lot of fun. Check it out, too. So the third prong of what we were going to do and what we're going to speak to is the idea of uh, developing um, institutional capacity for community engagement, how to get out and reach our communities to make us the best that we can be. Uh, to do that, there was originally a document we were using called Building Responsive Museums. Um, we had worked with that framework, so Marilyn Havelka is going to speak to her work with us using that framework. But in time, it grew into a new one, a new document called Engaging Your Community, a toolkit for museums. And we're going to talk about how that process has worked. Uh, Mary Collier was a big part of that, so I appreciate that she's going to talk about that. And then Katie is our, our newest guinea pig, um, and she's going to get to try the new thing and is very excited about that. So we're going to talk about how this process is supposed to help us reach out to our communities. So I am just, oh, one last thing, I just shout out thank you to all the other members of the advisory committee. It's been an interesting three years and we've all learned a lot. Um, few in the room, I think. Uh, Yetta Rigel, Lori Nelson, wave if you're here. I saw somebody. Yeah, there's the yeah, other. Uh, Amy Dunlop, Liz Driver, Madeline Callahan, uh, Cheryl Fraser, and Karen Bachman. All people besides myself have been involved. So been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to start with Mary Collier and let her talk about what the whole process of creating Engaging Your Community was. Mary? Okay, hi everyone. Thank you very much, Amy, for that lovely introduction. Um, so, as Amy said, I'm going to give a bit of a background about where Engaging Your Community, um, a toolkit for museums, all came from and what it is at this point. So, it all started um, as a document called um, Building Responsive Museums, which was created by the Learning Coalition back in 2009. And the Learning Coalition was a group of uh, museum associations, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Ontario, and Nova Scotia, who worked on these common projects um, to, to kind of foster professional development in our, in our various provinces. And this was the final um, product that that um, group produced. And so when we were building our um, museum succession project. Um, we wanted to build the capacity, particularly of kind of uh, nonprofit museums um, in both their governance and then their ability to kind of assess their own community engagement. Um, and so we thought, this is a fabulous tool that we already have. Let's get out there and help some people work through it together um, and kind of see where they're at. So we worked with two museums, the Aurora Historical Society and Ruthland Park um, that uh, Marilyn's going to talk about, so back in 2013 and 2014. And we found that while the content and the purpose of building responsive museums was excellent, um, and we really liked what it was trying to do, um, it was a little bit less user-friendly than we wanted it to be. So what we did was we decided to take a bit of a break in delivery, and we teamed up with Tamarack. It's a, um, 
Institute for Community Engagement out of Kitchener. Um, community engagement is their business, so and they helped us to kind of rework it a little bit and um, kind of make it into something newer and a little bit, hopefully, a little bit more user friendly. So building response to museums was a discussion framework, um, and it had five sections: so audience and community, mandate and planning, um, public perception public involvement and public experience. And so in each of those sections, there are discussion questions, um, really good, important questions that get you thinking about what your relationship is with the community, what you want it to be, where you're at right now. Um, and a process to kind of get at what are the evidence behind the assumptions that you're making and um, how you can kind of create some priorities out of, out of the answers to those questions. But we found that the two times that we did use it within this project, um, we really relied heavily on a very skilled facilitator to kind of take what was in the discussion framework and kind of operationalize it, um, make it something that we could use in sort of community consultation conversations. So when we got together with Tamarack, we asked them to um, make it into more of a toolkit, something where we can do the work up front. We've made facilitation plans for every step of the way so that you can kind of take it, open it up, and work through it step by step and not necessarily have to rely on, say, the Ontario Museum Association or another um, person who's really familiar with the toolkit in order to um, use it yourself at your own museum. So we kind of wanted it to be something that could live on beyond the funding period of this project. So, yes, that is what we came out with. Not big on design, but the content is all there. <laughs> so the purpose didn't really change that much from building responsive museums to engaging your community. Um, so still providing your museum with a process um, to deepen your understanding of what community engagement means. Um, examine, evaluate, and articulate your current relationship and your role with your community, so kind of looking at what's going on right now, and then exploring how community engagement can be part of planning and delivery at all levels and in all aspects of the museum. So what, what could the future hold? Um, but we just wanted to go about it in a little bit of a different way, kind of break it down, and we came up with six steps. Um, and so you, the idea is that you can kind of open it up and see what is involved in each step and how long each step is gonna take, who needs to um, be involved in the process and what other kind of resources you need. So I'll just take you quickly through the six steps. Yes, the timeline is about four to nine months in total. Um, so the first step is to form a working group. So this is kind of your team within the museum that's gonna go through this process. Um, and then the second is to find a facilitator. So whether this is an external person or somebody you're recruiting internally who's got some facilitation skills, either should work. Um, and then you do a bit of a working group orientation. So this is a you know two or three hour meeting. Um, and it's just an opportunity to align what everybody's individual goals are with the institutional goal of going through this process um, and make sure there's a common understanding of what communi community engagement is and what is uh, going to be involved in completing engaging your community. Then you have a bit of a group self-assessment. So this is where all those questions from building responsive museums and the different categories come in. This is where we're gonna have those conversations. Um, kind of take stock of current museum activities, identify areas where community engagement could be improved. And there's a bit that happens um, before this meeting about kind of gathering information about the museum just so that everybody's on the same page. So sometimes, you know, the board doesn't know what happens day to day, but the volunteers don't know what happens at the board. So everybody just needs to be on the, page about, on the same page about how it all works at your museum currently. Then there's the community consultation. That's kind of the fun part. So you're kind of inviting people a couple months in advance to, to come and take part. Um, and then you're having either a full day or a couple of um, shorter sessions. And you're inviting people in to kind of dream up what future opportunities there might be for the museum. Um, and what the relationship to the community might look like. And for this, there's three different facilitation options that we've included in the toolkit, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, but you can pick whichever one works kind of for your group and what the dynamic is and your kind of um, relationship to the community engagement at this point. 
And then the all-important step of planning for the future. So you've had all these great conversations. You've looked in. You've looked out. You've talked together. Um, what does it all mean? Um, where are you going to go with that? So it's time for the working group again to kind of debrief the entire process, um, compare results from the self-assessment and the community consultation, and determine what are the opportunities to go forward and what's feasible. So there are three different community consultation options. Um, community conversations is a bit of kind of roundtable discussions. Um, serious play has things more like games. So you're doing some drawing, you're doing some categories, um, something a little bit more playful. Um, visioning change is, it's a little bit of a, a more facilitated, kind of deeper, sophisticated discussion about um, possibilities for the community. But the nice thing is, the outcome of all three of these facilitation options is the same. So you get kind of three products out of it. You get these impact implementation grids, um, idea worksheets of some of the ideas that have been developed out of these um, different processes, and then wheels of engagement, which actually say for each individual who participated, what are they actually interested in being involved in as things develop. So you can take a look at it yourself. It's online on our website. You can download the whole thing. You can download bits and pieces. It's up to you. Um, what we do ask, though, is if you do use it, let us know. Um, if there's issues with it that we can fix, we want to do that. Um, we're curious to know how it's going. If you're, if you're using it, if you're successful, um, just, just get in touch with us and let us know. Because um, we want to keep improving it, and we want to if possible, kind of gather the stories of the people who have made use of it and, and share those with, with everybody else. Um, so we are working with four museums in Ontario right now through this um, funding from Trillium. Um, the Art Gallery of Mississauga, Museum on the Boyne, um, the Bush Plain Heritage Centre and North Lanark Regional Museum. So we're really excited to get started kind of learning from each other in this process. And I think that's about it for me. OK, so that's what we've done and sort of what we were looking at doing. What we'd like to do now is just, if you're thinking, is this something my museum would be interested in doing, we're going to try and show you two perspectives. On the one hand, we are going to have Marilyn Havelka, who, as Mary said, was one of our first people to work through the building responsive museum process, and just what came out of that and where the, what they've done moving forward and how it's worked and what hasn't worked. Because as we just heard in our initial talk, right, things that don't work are important too, right? That time and all these other things are, are going on. So we're going to look at that and so uh, I'll have Marilyn come up next. Good morning, everyone. I just have to probably do this a bit. Is that okay? So uh, I'll just give you a brief overview, Ruthven Park National Historic Site in Cayuga. Has anybody been there before? I'm always doing demographic information. Anyways, um, we're a rural site. Uh, we have 1,500 acres. To, say, to, to put in a nutshell what we do, we're conserving the built and the natural heritage or cultural and natural heritage. We do have education programs, other programs, exhibits, and uh, we do a lot of habitat restoration work as well. So we do environmental as well as the heritage. And uh, we, I, I can't remember how I first got involved in this. I guess I had a conversation with uh, Trish Hopkin. Anyways, it was an opportunity for Ruth Van to, um, to do some work, and I, I guess I was struggling, and I still struggle sometimes with you know, defining who our community is. Um, and I struggle with um, market segments um, for audience development. And the reason is, I guess, I just want everyone to come to Ruth Van. So, and how do you really narrow, narrow it down? And I'm still having that conversation with myself. So we were the prong three um, on community engagement. 
And uh, I just want to say, I, I don't have sexy slides. Uh, I guess I, what I've chosen is um, just to kind of go through the process, and I thought maybe you'd look at the slides instead of me. So that may offer something to you as well. So we started back in 2013 and uh, expressed an interest to the OMA to become uh, part of this process. And you see, I guess what got me interested in that is I read um, some of the symptoms or triggers, why, when a museum might decide to use the discussion framework. So I went through a few of them, uh, decline in visitation, check, decline in volunteer support, check, loss or unexpected gain of financial support or sources, check, um, not moving to a new location, difficulty in recruiting board members, check, uh, lack of vision, inability to articulate the museum's value to the community, and so on. So I, I kind of saw some uh, opportunities there that, uh, of areas that we could work on. However, um, we were also in a bind. Our site needed to complete a strategic plan. And that was part of the CMOG review that was done back a few years ago. And under the governance policy, they said to re, resubmit or submit a strategic plan, which we didn't have. And uh, we had talked about it for a long time, uh, started one uh, in my, I started one, but it didn't get anywhere because you keep setting things aside. But um, so here I had two things on, the, on my plate at one time. Strategic plan, which needed to be done by a, a deadline of October 31st of 2013. But I was also working on this museum succession, which had a deadline of January 31st, 2014. So what do we do? Do we do both together? Do I drop one? I couldn't drop the uh, strategic plan because it was a requirement, requirement of the ministry. So we thought, I thought we would maybe put the museum succession just on hold and complete the strategic plan. So the strategic plan, we, we had a different um, take on what we did. It was not a long, involved process, and I've just put our vision and mission here. Uh, one, th one difficulty we had with our site, we're owned by a land trust. We're a not-for-profit, non-government organization. And um, the land trust manages the site, and that's our, basically our board that I report to. But we're a Ruthven Park National Historic Site. And we had two vision statements, two mission statements, and it just didn't work. So one thing that came out of all of this process, we've got one vision, one mission. And uh, I'm not saying it doesn't have to be revised, but uh, there we have it. And uh, we're, we're one, we're, we're the land trust, but we're Ruthven Park. And it, what happened is it confused a lot of people because they didn't know who was what. So that was one thing that uh, this strategic plan did, uh, did uh, accomplish for us. So we seconded an entrepreneur, Ontario, and uh, to work on the strategy. And uh, we, we actually sent out uh, 75 surveys to the community, like business people, uh, other museums, members, people that didn't uh, visit our site. And we had a good uh, return rate of 39%. So uh, we, we synthesized all of those comments and sent it out to our board and a few other people that we invited to our strategic planning session. Um, we used an electronic support system. We worked with Queen's University and I mentioned Entrepreneur Ontario. And uh, we used a series or a network of laptops to actually come up with a strategic plan, which we did in one day. So. Anyways, it seemed to work. Um, so as I mentioned, we revisited our mission and, and uh, vision. We had four, uh, 24 people show up actually for that day. It was very tedious. But uh, I thought in the end that we came up with not a bad plan to start with. 
So what it came up with, I don't know if you can read that, is our vision for Ruth and Park for five years. And it's not that I'm here speaking about strategic plans, but it does lead into the next stage of working with the OMA and museum succession. So of course, everybody identifies uh, financial, and, uh, financial security and sustainability. We want to be known as a cultural hub, community engagement and solid partnerships, strong education focus focus. And some of our goals, um, of course, financial sustainability again, program, audience development, a strategy and infrastructure needs review, and uh, deliver an array of high quality programs and events, I got to the marketing plan, um, to a broad audience and grow our audience by 10% a year. So that's what we're working on. So then I thought, well, that kind of really works in well with what we could do with the OMA and museum succession. So our next step was to then um, work with the outcomes of this strategic plan. I'm just going to get rid of these. On program and audience development and also on the what the perception of the site was from the community. So the workshop, uh, I, we already mentioned the workshop was supported by the OMA. I mentioned that we had that quick deadline. So um, what we started to do is we sent out another, well we sent out 60 invitations for people to attend a half day information gathering workshop. And uh, re we realized the timing wasn't great. It was December the 7th. People are gearing up for Christmas. But, and we had just engaged our board in a full day uh, strategic plan workshop. So we didn't really know how successful the day would be. So we ended up having 16 attend the session. The board members again, um, one a local museum, members from our museum, and we had one person that had never been to Ruth Van before, and I kind of latched on him because I'm really interested to talking to people who haven't been there, particularly from the local community, and why, why not? What kept them away? The workshop shop explored perceptions of the site and its current programming. We identified Ruth Van's potential audiences, and we developed profiles for four high potential audiences and generated advice for the board to consider as it plans for future audience development. Before the uh, participants attended, however, they were asked to read section three of the toolkit or the uh, Mary had pointed this out early, the Learning Coalition, and it was on perception. And I found uh, some of the questions were very difficult for people that didn't kind of know the inner workings of the museum. Like for instance, how does the museum communicate the mandate of your audience's visitors? Um, describe in detail your museum's community and, and certain questions. So we had a lot of discussion around that. And basically, we came up with the uh, answer, especially from the people that had attended this session, that, um, that uh, you know, we, we, we had pretty good perception in the community. However, our perception outside of our local community was even higher. So obviously, we had some work to do. Basically, they rated our perception as very good. Um, we moved on to uh, examining potential audiences. The group were split into four working groups. We use a lot of post-it notes all over the place. Um, and uh, we had names on the wall. Then we grouped the notes according to similarities. As a result, four audiences were identified and, for, and we further explored these audiences. So you see from here, we have students and learners, nature enthusiasts, history enthusiasts, and rental users. We also had a large list of ungrouped um, 
uh, other audiences that we could consider, but uh, we thought we would gear it to these four. I mean, other audiences could have been ghost lovers, which is really hot at the moment, high schoolers, photographers, that type of thing. So from the four high potential audiences, the working groups then developed an audience profile for each, description of the audience, and what this audience can provide to Ruth Venn, signs of successful engagement, and challenge of engagement. So the next step was we needed, and remember going back to the strategic plan, we need a good program plan or audience development plan for Ruth Venn. So that we formed a subcommittee or a task force committee from our board and started working on that program uh, plan. Now, today it is still not completed, and, uh, but I did find information out of the workshop was invaluable to writing this program and audience development plan. And I think we've got about 36 pages written of the plan. We were kind of doing a, uh, writing a scenario of what we're doing now, you know, doing kind of an environmental scan, what people are doing generally, and how we can improve our programs in the future and deliver them. So in that respect, uh, the work that we did do with these, the community and also our board has helped with that program plan. And as with all museums, I'm sure you go through these challenges, something else comes up like a uh, grant you have to write or your budget needs to be submitted or more policies need to be completed. So I've put the program plan aside about three times and it's really frustrating because when you really get working on it, you need to finish it. And when you put it aside, it's almost like starting all over again. So next thing on my plate is to finish this program and audience development plan that came out of the strategic plan, but also was identified through our meeting on museum succession. And then out of the program plan, we will do a marketing plan. So that is uh, next on our list of things to do. Um, I. You know, in retrospect, looking back at uh, the program, um, we have some next steps, and I don't know if you can read them there, but reviewing the outcomes of the workshop, decide what kind of impact on the community uh, it is prepared to commit, identify the steps required to achieve that impact, identify how success will be measured, identify which steps Ruth then can implement its own, which it needs to, in, to do in collaboration with others, identify, of course, financial, human, and information resources, develop a timeline, identify roles and responsibilities for staff, volunteers, partners, and make decisions and take actions. So this is um, what I'm working on currently. Um, one thing that hopefully will come out of this is in order to do proper programs and audience development at our site, even though we have a 1,500 acre site and multiple buildings, we don't have enough space. And if I wanna run programs, I have to compete with ourselves on rentals for weddings. So uh, it will hopefully result in some capital plan to provide additional space so that we can uh, run programs even though we do have rentals. So uh, all in all, I think um, the process has been very, uh, very good. It did kind of get us moving and move the ball, get, got the ball rolling for prog program and audience development. I still, um, to be honest, struggle with how we get the community more involved in the site. Once again, the challenges of the day-to-day sometimes inhibits you attending community meetings, which is really important. It's great to be involved in the local chambers of commerce, but you know, in our area, we have five, five or six chambers of commerce, so our, our yes, chambers. And you know, how can you attend all of those and, and want to be part of the community? But uh, once again, I think you have to pick and choose and uh, where you're going and uh, prioritize, uh, involve your staff, 
And uh, I hope we can, con I hope next time you see me, you can ask me for a copy of our program and audience development plan, as well as the marketing plan. So that's uh, kind of my recollection of how we use the information. We're still using it. I did go back and read the new document, and I think we followed it pretty much as it was stated. I did like a lot of the graphs and the additions that had been added there. So I'm going to go back and revisit that as well. So thank you. Okay, so as we said, Marilyn was one of the, the first people who got involved with this whole process. So for those of you kind of wondering about what you might be doing or how that might work, I thought that was really good. It also brought up some of the, the problems that we all know, right? Time. Time is always this whole huge problem. Um, so that's, that's one we've all got to work through all the time. It also brought one thing that was important, I think, that we felt too. She talked about the, the language of the questions sometimes being a little difficult when you're working with the community. That was really one of the core things we wanted to switch to for engaging your community. So anyway, there's Marilyn's perspective being sort of at the end of the process. We're going to have Katie tell us about the beginning of the process and why she wanted to play with us in the first place. So come on up, Katie. Good morning. I decided to go uh, without slides because, um, you know, it would have, we're pretty early on in the process, so it would have just been a lot of pictures of me reading the toolkit, and yeah. I figured that was enough. <laughs> So, um, by a show of hands, did anyone attend the opening reception at the OMA conference last year in Alliston at Museum on the Boyne? Yay! <laughs> okay, so some of you are familiar with our site. Uh, just to give the others a little background, uh, the Museum on the Boyne is a small community museum that is owned and operated by the town of New Tecumseh. It was originally formed in 1960 um, as the South Simcoe Pioneer Museum. At that time, Agila, Essa, and Tecumseh Townships joined forces with the town of Alliston to create a shared museum. Fast forward 55 years, and thanks to amalgamation, we now represent five municipalities. Um, Agila Tosserontio, Bradford West Willenberry, Innisville, Essa, and New Tecumseh. So our mandate is to depict the history of those five municipalities from settlement to present day. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> we have a whopping staff of two, the museum programmer who is on contract and myself as a full-time uh, museum and heritage coordinator. We have an advisory committee uh, which consists of a counselor from each of those municipalities and a couple of citizens with an interest in history. We have three great heritage buildings on site and more artifacts than we really need, um, but what we're missing is an engaged community. So when the opportunity arose to work through the toolkit with the assistance of the OMA and Tamarack, I jumped at the chance. Um, at the start of this process, before I really knew a lot about what the toolkit offered or how the process was going to go, my goals were as follows. <laughs> Number one, increase the awareness of the museum. Uh, nothing frustrates me more than hearing the phrase, I've lived here for over 20 years and I've never been in before, or there's a museum in Alliston? Um, I've heard this too many times to count and honestly, it drives me bonkers. Um, don't people know that one of the famous five, Emily Murphy, was born in Cookstown? Or that Clarksville was renamed B-Town and eventually Beaton uh, because of the beekeeper D.A. Jones? Um, how about the fact that Theodore Pringle Loblaw uh, was raised in Alliston and uh, by his uh, grandparents, the Stevensons, and he donated the money uh, that he made from that little grocery chain that he started um, to start the first hospital in Alliston, uh, which he named after his grandparents. But people aren't aware of these amazing stories because honestly, we haven't been doing our best job at uh, telling them because we just don't have the community engagement right now. My second goal was to make sure that the museum had a purpose other than to collect, preserve, and interpret life in South Simcoe. <laughs> 
overwhelmed with the scope of our mandate, the museum has traditionally presented that same story of small town Ontario that can be found everywhere. Um, every time I'd put together a new exhibit, a little voice in the back of my head kept saying, so what? Uh, for those of you who have completed CMS courses in the past, you'll recognize that little voice was Kathy Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> She's like the little angel that sits on my shoulder. <laughs> Yeah, I figured. <laughs> um, it bothered me that we didn't really have the wow factor. Uh, but like so many of us in the room, I had too much on my plate to really do anything about it. Um, it wasn't until I read a TripAdvisor review that was right there in print, and I knew I had to make time for this. The review read, and I quote, the contents of this museum are locally found artifacts with little to any connection to the history of the area. Granted, Alliston plays an insignificant role in the history of anywhere, but it would have been interesting to learn about the history of potato farming and the impact on a small village when a huge international manufacturing company sets up shop in the fields. Ouch. <laughs> that one really stung. <laughs> Um, the person who posted that did say the staff was very pleasant, so I guess that's something. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> um, my third goal was to demonstrate the value of the museum to each community in our mandate and create a sense of ownership that would ultimately lead to financial contributions from all five municipalities that we represent. Currently, the town of New Tecumseh provides us with the bulk of the funding, with the other two museums providing $200 to $400 annually. The councillors who sit on my advisory committee want, really do want their municipalities to contribute to the museum, but they feel at this point that they cannot demonstrate to their um, councils and their taxpayers that um, their communities feel any connection to our museum at all. So, when I printed, first printed the toolkit, I'll admit I was a little overwhelmed by the size of it. <laughs> um, but once I sat down and started to read through it, I found out that it is very user friendly. The reason that it is so big is that everything has been provided for you. Um, there are questions to prompt you, scenarios to work through each step of the process. It doesn't matter if you're starting out just like us or if you already have a foundation that you'd like to expand upon. Whatever you need, it's in there. Uh, when it came to selecting a working group, I wanted to have people who had a vested interest in making our museum, our particular museum, better. Uh, people who really feel the magic of the place despite what that man said, and uh, see its potential, um, but can also see where we're lacking and what can be improved. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about them because honestly, my working group is amazing and they're the heart of this project. Um, our working committee consists of Innisfil Councillor Stan Dario and New Tecumseh Councillor Fran Sainsbury. Both sit on my advisory committee and have worked with heritage groups and museums throughout their long political careers. Wendy Rowland is the community, uh, the senior supervisor of community services and recreation, um, and my boss. And until she came to town, no one at the management level was really willing to fight for the museum. Um, Wendy came in and she sees the uh, potential. She sees that we're one of the gems in the community. Um, and uh, she's making sure that we receive the same level of promotion as everybody else. Vanessa Leo is a graduate of, a recent graduate of the Georgian College Museum and Gallery Studies program. Um, and she has worked and or volunteered in nearly every level of museum. So she has a lot of experience and she's single-handedly responsible for getting our collection under control recently. <laughs> um, Allison McDonald um, is a uh, completing her Master's in Museum Studies from the University of Toronto and brought so much enthusiasm and energy this summer um, that made us all strive to work harder. Peter Monahan, a retired teacher who's completed the OMA Certificate of Museum Studies and volunteered at the museum for over 20 years. So we have a really great group. Um, 
This group was so eager to jump in that at our working group orientation, I had to uh, have some coaching help from Mary and Christine and Louise to kind of bring them back. So right now they are working, a subcommittee is working on bringing some information um, about the museum. So our next group session, the self-assessment, um, is November 17th. I know that like the review, um, it, there will be some things in that meeting that sting. Uh, it's hard not to take constructive criticism um, and discussions about weakness to heart when you put so much of yourself into the museum, but I do believe that there's always room to do better. There's a small chance that I will spend November 18th under my desk with a bottle of wine and a chocolate cake, but the chance is really, really small. <laughs> Uh, following the self-assessment, we will be doing the community consultation and creating the action plan. And I'm most excited for the community consultation. We've come up with a list of people who really represent the best of the best of local businesses, community members, school groups, council members. We're looking to create partnerships and learn from groups who are doing the right things and, uh, and to see what can be done to increase the value of the museum in the community's eyes. Um, I think the community consultation will also show people that uh, we're actively committed to making the museum an accessible and engaging part of our community, and with their support, we'll be able to create a space that is everything to everyone. So I will wrap up with some of my hopes. Um, I hope hearing about our little story, again, we're just starting out, uh, will encourage you to take a look at the toolkit and see how it could benefit your museum. I hope that at a future conference, I can tell you that the people are using our museum to its full potential, that our visitor numbers are up, our program participants are up, and let's be honest, our monetary contributions are up. <laughs> Um, I hope that any future online comments about the museum are incredibly positive, and I never again hear, there's a museum in Alliston? And lastly, I hope that all of you live streaming this at home were not playing a drinking game based on the amount of times I said community today. So thank you for listening. Okay, I know they are uh, trying to encourage us to get back caught up on time, but I did want to give you a few minutes to, uh, to perhaps ask any questions. So is there anybody who has a quick question for any of our group of speakers today? You'll have to put your hands way up if you're in the back, because I... Everybody's ready for lunch. Everyone's yeah, like, <laughs> when's the food coming? Um, before, like, oh, okay, there we go. Mm. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, it's just one of my big grandiose goals <laughs> to, um, what I'd really like is for the museum to be, uh, rather than just a place to go and have a tour, that we um, are kind of a, a hub for the community. Like I'd like people to uh, be able to come and hang out and um, sketch uh, some of the artifacts or uh, come in and learn how to do a certain craft and um, just, Right now, we're really not getting that, and so we may not be able to be everything to everyone, which I'm still working on, I hope. <laughs> but, um, but just being more than just kind of a, you know, oh, yay, I'm going to go and tour the exhibits. I want it to be bigger than that. Any other questions? We, uh, I should have mentioned that. We had Carrie Brooks Joyner. She was the facilitator. And I thought it was great because she was neutral. She kept the conversation going, asked the right questions, and involved everyone. Because sometimes you worry at something like that, that staff kind of take over and answer everything because they work there and, and they know. But um, she kept it really, you know, right on time and on schedule and actually had observations, wrote a report, and wrote the next step. So it was, yeah, it was very good to have the facilitator. And we do not have an outside facilitator. Um, our working committee group elected me the facilitator, which at first I was not really convinced was the best idea, but I'm using it as a professional development tool to 
distance myself from the museum and really let them tell me what they would like to do rather than me putting in my two cents. <laughs> Um, in the toolkit, when we've been first running these first sessions, um, we were certainly providing uh, facilitators. In the toolkit, though, there's uh, instructions about how you could go out and find your own facilitator, facilitator and how to do that. So for all of you thinking, yes, we want to be just like Katie, uh, and moving forward with this, there is information in the toolkit to try and help you through that process, because I think it, it certainly helps to have an outside facilitator, but uh, Katie's a one-person show here, so she's all good. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. I just add about the outside facilitator was good at uh, drawing in people that might have just sat there and not participated. They were, because they didn't know, they didn't think they knew enough. So it was important to get, have their voice um, because I've been, and to have the right facilitator to be able to do that because I've, I've had other sessions and, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't, the answers we got from people was, uh, well, keep doing what you're doing. But, I mean, that doesn't help the process. So the facilitator kind of guided the way, you know, really encouraged them and, uh, and, and, and kind of made them participate, which was really good. And, and as the end result, the, those participants really enjoyed the experience. One more question then. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, we are so early into the process that um, I don't really have a kind of a favorite part. Um, I guess the most rewarding part would be that um, my working group was really eager to be a part of the, the uh, project um, and that they have really dedicated their time to going through the toolkit and, uh, um, and coming up with great community people to invite to our community consultation that maybe our, the staff wouldn't um, have those connections. So the working group, creating a core group is really important part of the project, I think. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the, the positive thing that came out of it was to actually, you know, take the action and start a program plan and start thinking about the programming. And the reason being, um, I, I found we were running, and I thought they were quality programs. We had very good speakers come in, and I just was, I was not getting the participation from the community. So you think, well, are they not interested in that? Maybe a more scholarly, you know, presentation. Do they want something, something different? And uh, so I guess I was running the programs according to what I thought people wanted, and that's not necessarily so. I think you have to listen to your constituents and see what they want. And of course, you have to make sure that you follow your mission. I mean, you don't go out of line that way. But I think. The program plan has been uh, kind of eye-opening, I think, for myself and uh, for the task force that I'm working with. And as I, I mentioned, out of it, we will have the marketing plan. I also, I also would really like to talk to people, as I mentioned earlier, that have not visited youth men, particularly those in the community, and why not, and, and ask the question to the community you know, what if we didn't exist? You know, so. Okay, well thank you. Um, we're gonna stop the questions there just because we are trying to stay on track and try and get these Ignite people, I believe, are starting next. We have one question from our live stream, actually. Excellent. I don't know if, it, oh. Oh. I don't know <laughs> if you can see me, but um, one of our live stream viewers asked, how do you decide who to invite to uh, your community consultation sessions? So you can talk to the camera because they're listening. Oh. <laughs> uh, for us, um, in our very first working group orientation session, we talked about who in the community um, do we see that really seems to be doing things right. Um, and uh, so a couple of nonprofit groups that uh, popped up that you see they're advertising everywhere and that they're um, a really positive force in the community. So for us, we want to emulate that. And so we're going to invite a lot of those people to um, our community consultation to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, and uh, see if we'll be able to grow kind of um, in that direction with their support. Uh, what we did, we sent out, as I mentioned, a lot of surveys and questionnaires in advance of, of having 
our consultations, but I looked certainly at our board to be invited, um, volunteers, um, other colleagues uh, within the community locally and maybe farther afield, uh, especially those who had a specific uh, expertise in areas, let's say it was marketing, let's say it was uh, program development, members and, you know, if I went to town and talked to somebody, I asked if they were interested, basically. So um, that's, how, that's how we did it. I want to just mention that one of the helpful tools in the toolkit is this generating ideas for who to invite. So lots of different kinds of organizations kind of brainstorming about everybody who exists in your community who has another kind of organization or an interest group or whatever. And then going the next step of saying, OK, so of all these people, this is another one, the inviting people to the table worksheet, um, where you have all these ideas of different organizations that you can invite. So who is the best person in your working group? Who has the strongest connection? Because the idea with it is to actually reach out personally to people to invite them to this community consultation. So, um, so going through and basically saying, okay, you know, Katie is going to contact these five different people personally to invite them, and somebody else who has a better connection with the, these different groups is going to contact these individuals. So, it's all part of the toolkit. <laughs> See, the lovely Miss Mary has the answer for everything. <laughs> so, yeah, please go on to the website, and it's up there now. Engaging your community, it. We have slaved to make it as user-friendly as possible, and, and it's beautifully laid out. It's very attractive. So, uh, so go and look at it. All the stages are there, and it's something, if you, something you think your museum is ready to go ahead and do, um, give it a try. You know, it's, it's always good to reach out to people, and as Katie found, it's, it's so invigorating to get that response to find they actually care and they want to reach back out to you, and, and that's great to know that they actually do care. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you. Everybody. Um, I'm Melissa Phillips and I'm here to thank our speakers. Um, so I would like to present all four of you with um, a gift from our local arrangements committee. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> and so next up in this room we have the Ignite sessions. Um, please note that there will be no break in between the sessions. Um, and this will be followed by lunch with exhibitors in Augustus 2, 3, and 4, sponsored by Cultural Asset Management Group. And also just a reminder not to forget your trade show passport um, to win a prize at the end of the conference. So please enjoy. Awesome.